Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been here a couple of times, but usually it was just to help Roslyn with worship or to help with the Living Water group just off of the 91 freeway. We've come and do some events together. So it's wonderful to be here this morning with you guys. And like Roman has said, uh, I do live in Japan, and I've lived here for almost 10 years now. I think we're going on our 11th year this July. And time's just flown. You know, we, we, I grew up in Corona. My family's been born and raised in Corona. And uh, God gave us the call, the missions, to all move to Okinawa, Japan. And uh, people do ask, well, where's Okinawa, Japan? Where, where, where is it located in Japan? So I, I do have a slideshow to, or a PowerPoint to just show you. And as you see in the bottom right-hand corner, that's in relations to the mainland Japan. Uh, where Okinawa is a little island located just uh, three hours south by plane from the mainland Japan. And a very wonderful island, tropical island, has boasts one of the beautiful, most beautiful beaches all over the world. And uh, that's where we have our Bible college at. And the whole goal with my father and with my family is to just outreach to the Japanese people to share and to tell them about the love of Christ. But then also we have our Bible college, as we have mentioned before. And the whole purpose of the Bible college is to train up those converts and those people and to make them into a disciples and into leaders for the church and with the, uh, wherever God has in store for them. But uh, so we are located in Okinawa, Japan. But for me, I moved out of Okinawa probably about three years ago. And God has called me to uh, go to the mainland Japan to start an extension campus of our Bible college. And I used to live in Tokyo for two years, but recently, back in November, uh, October, I moved to a new area called Fukuoka, the city, uh, Fukuoka, Japan. And I have another PowerPoint to show you. It's uh, in that red dotted area. That's where I live in location to the mainland Japan. And uh, that area, Fukuoka, is very special because spiritually it is dead. Christianity has a very low presence there. There is barely any churches, and the churches that are there in that city have an older congregation that got saved during the 70s or the 80s, and they're getting older now, but the younger generation aren't going to church as much. So it's interesting how God has just called me out there. So what we did is we brought the extension campus we had. Uh, we had a, another extension campus in Tokyo, and we moved that down to Fukuoka, Japan with, for a church plant to share the love of Jesus. And we're just open to see what God wants to do. Uh, right now, we have a Bible study every Sunday at a community service. And uh, it's been going good because there are people who are coming. We have probably about three to four people who come, and they're interested in Christianity. And they're always interested. Japanese culture is you're interested in something, but you're not so forward to go into what you're interested you usually kind of sit back and watch and then you kind of slowly enter so people know who we are uh we have the bible college students so we'll have people from murrieta california come and study for a semester with us and they stick out like sore thumbs we had girls blonde hair blue eyes and we had students who were six feet tall and they just tower over the japanese people and it's just real wonderful so um if you guys could, whenever you think of me or you think of the Bible College in Japan, please pray for us because currently when I go back this Wednesday, I'm going to be looking for a building that we can move our Bible College facility in Fukuoka out of our big house that we have, a six-room uh, house, and we want to move it to a building to have a more permanent establishment and to reach out to the people and just ha uh, offer more things to them to just share the love of Christ. So uh, please, just continue to pray for us. But if you would, oh, you could cancel the, the slideshow, we're good. But if you would, this morning, would you please turn to Daniel chapter 6. I come this morning, and I believe that I do have a message from the Lord that he has put upon my heart to encourage you this morning on the area of prayer. And again, I believe that God wants to speak to our hearts this morning out of Daniel chapter 6. So would you please turn there? Now, as we begin, I want to ask you a question. What is your annual monthly cell phone bill? You know, I think that's one thing we all have in common here. We get cell phone bills. And what is the annual cost you pay every month? 
It's interesting because I was interested. What is the usual, what is the annual average monthly bill that people pay? For cell phones, if you have Sprint, you pay an average of $144 a month. If you have AT&T, well, it's a little cheaper. That's $141. Not too bad. Well, if you have T-Mobile, that's $120. It's even cheaper. But I think we all know the number one most expensive provider. What is it? Verizon, right? Verizon is an average of $153 a month. You know, it's interesting when you think about cell phone bills, when you think about the phone that you use, because really what you're doing with that company is you're agreeing to pay to talk, to use their machine, to use your service. And as you promise to use their service for so many years, you pay on a monthly that price that you, uh, that you commit. But we know sometimes your average price doesn't always stay that, right? Sometimes it goes up as you're talking more or you're using more data on your phone. It just uh, it fluctuates sometimes. Well, this morning, I want to ask you a question. I want to flip that cell phone question. Now, if prayer, if you had to pay for prayer like a cell phone bill, how much would it cost? Would it be extravagant or would it be very low? You know, I think for all of us, prayer is the one thing that we can think in our heads and go, yeah, it's important. But when we start to access it in our life and how much do we pray, then we kind of cringe, right? Oh, you kind of grit your teeth, right? Well, this morning, I come with you with an encouragement that we need to be praying, that we need to commit our life to a life of prayer. Prayer is so important for the Christian life. A godly author named James Oswald Sanders, he says this about prayer. He says that prayer is the Christian's breath and air. And I think that is so true because prayer is the number one thing that we have that communicates us with God the Father. And we could come to him at any time. The book of Hebrews tells us that because we are saved by the blood of Jesus, we can boldly come before the throne room of God at any time. And God is there ready to listen and to answer to us. So I ask you this morning, are you praying? How much are you praying? Again, this morning, we'll be encouraged to be committed to a life of prayer. And we will see it looking at the life of Daniel. You know, there's so many men and women in the Bible that are just so wonderful to look at. Great role models. We have the father of faith, Abraham. We also have our father of the doctrine, Paul himself. And we even have great women in the Bible who shows us faith. We can think of the woman, uh, excuse me, her name, I forget her name, but the, the, the prostitute that saved the Israelites when they marched around the walls of Jericho, a woman of faith. Here we see Daniel, and what we can see automatically from him from, as a role model is he is a man of prayer. Now, I would like for us to, if you would, to read verses 1 to 9, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to dive right into verse 10, because that's where I believe God is really going to speak to our hearts this morning. It says in chapter 6 of Daniel, verse 1, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel, verse 3, distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit, the Holy Spirit, was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governor, satraps, sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. These men said, we shall not find any charge against this, against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Verse 6, so these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or any man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, 
establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius, verse 9, sign the written decree. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning. And again, we just thank you for the opportunity you have given to us to come before here together, to be encouraged through your word. And Lord, as we're encouraged with a clear encouragement with the area of applying prayer in our life, we pray that verse 10 would stick out to our hearts and it would be easy to hear as you are a teacher. Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would breathe words of life upon here and speak to our hearts. We just invite you for the, we invite you again in this time. Lord, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's easy to see in these nine verses the overview of what's going on. We see clearly that Daniel is distinguishing himself in rising up strongly as a political leader within the kingdom, and he is becoming a very mighty man. But as we can see, as Daniel is rising and God is using him, we see that Satan doesn't like it, and he uses his men to try to stop Daniel from rising in political power. And it's interesting to see because Daniel's a great guy, but it's not from his own power, but it tells us he was great because he had an excellent spirit. The Holy Spirit was working in his life. He was an instrument. Well, the people that didn't like Daniel, they try to stop him, and it tells us that they try to look for dirt upon him, try to scrounge up any dirty secrets or faults, but they can't find no one. It, they can't find anything. It tells us that he was faithful. You know, right away, we can look at Daniel's life, and we see a great encouragement this morning. And the encouragement is, is we also need to be faithful. We live in a time and in a world where many powerful people politically or in popularity, they are falling left and right due because of their morality. I found it shocking as so many accusations against Bill Cosby is rising, and more and more people are speaking up against Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby, right? We all like Bill Cosby, the Jello guy, right? But yet he was unfaithful, and now this dirt is being brought up, and he's not uh, defending himself. We all know more than likely these accusations are true. You know, this world is so filthy. It's so dirty. Satan wants to throw his dirt upon you, and he wants to make you to stumble with our eyes, with our mouth, with our thoughts and our actions. But yet for Christians, we need to rise above that. We need to be faithful to God himself. And the encouragement this morning to be faithful is, again, it goes to the word of God, but then also to prayer. We can see from Daniel that his relationship with God was his top priority. He didn't mess around with sin. He stayed above reproach. Now, if you would, would you please look at verse 10? Because this is where the main subject of this morning's portion is. It tells us that after King Darius signs a decree that only people can pray to him, Notice in verse 10, please listen. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his heart, uh, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. We see that Daniel chooses not to obey the rule to pray to only King Darius. In fact, he chooses to continue to pray to his God. We see that in the life of Daniel right now, he has a no compromise attitude with his relationship with God. Now, if we studied in Daniel and we can see from his life, he is a man who, again, it took no compromise in his relationship. We can see this in Daniel chapter 1. We know the story. All the captives from Israel are taken into Babylon. And Daniel and certain other young men are then given new identities to be the Babylonians. And then as he is in the kingdom, then he, they are to, Daniel is told that he can no longer follow his Jewish diet, but to eat the food of the kings. But we know the problem, that those food wasn't according to God's law. It wasn't kosher. Daniel and his three friends, as we know, it tells us that they purposed in their heart in chapter 1 not to eat the food from the king. We can also see Daniel had no compromise attitude here in verse 10. Because we see that the kingdom of Babylon has forbidden 
the people to pray to any other god except to the king for one month. But what does Daniel do? Well, he chooses not to obey the law and to continue to pray to his one and only God. You know, we can look at the life of Daniel in chapter 1, chapter 6, and the things that he has done, and we can think, well, what is so significant to what Daniel is doing? So what if he's not eating the food that God said not to eat? Well, so what if he didn't pray to God for one month if he chose to do? What would be so significant? Well, I think for Daniel, he knew that if he obeyed to the standards that were put before him, it would ruin his relationship with God. Daniel knew that if he ate that food that God had forbidden him to eat, then he would defile his body that was meant to serve and obey God the Father. If Daniel would be praying to the king and not to the one and only God, well, Daniel knew he would be ruining his communication with God by praying to someone other than him alone. I want to ask you guys, how serious is your relationship with God? Would you stop praying for, to God for one month if you were given $1 million in return? It's kind of heavy. Okay, well, well, would you stop praying to God f for one week for $2 million. Ooh, that kind of gets harder, huh? Well, okay, how about, would you stop praying to God for only three days if you would receive $5 million in return? Don't answer, uh, you know, don't answer. It's okay, but, you know, we ask these questions, and before we think, yeah, our relationship with God is so good, but then when we're thrown with the questions that make it harder and harder, you know, for me too, I, I, I'll be truthful. You start thinking, Man, I don't know, man. For only three days, you don't pray to God and $5 million? Man, that is tempting. I, I don't know what I would do, seriously. But see, Daniel was faced with this kind of situation. The situation for him was stop praying to your God for one month and your life will be fine. Or if you choose not to obey, then expect trouble. You know, I call this what Daniel has faced here, a Daniel situation, a Daniel scenario. The scenario is to follow God or to compromise in your relationship with God. That's what the world will throw to us. And see, we know so easy, oh, of course I can't stop my relationship with God. Oh, of course I got to follow him so hard, Zach. Of course we know. It's easy to agree, but then it can get hard to do. Maybe you're going through a Daniel situation. I know there are Christians who are going through a Daniel situation right now. They're thinking, do I go to church or do I catch that Green Bay game at 10 o'clock? You know, people, people are faced with those situations. Should I sleep a couple more hours and skip church or should I get up and go fellowship? You know, people are faced. Those are Daniel situations. The situations that will make you think to compromise or to not compromise your relationship. See, Jesus is so clear that there can be no compromise in our relationship with him. Because he says it in Matthew 12, 30, he who is not with me is against me. Either you are all for Jesus or you are not for Jesus. You have to be sold out for him as a follower. As Christians, our relationship can have no compromise. Zach, I know this is, that's so easy to understand, but man, it can be hard to do. You're right. Compromising in our life can be hard. Well, there is a way that we can fight against compromising. There is a way to fight against the wickedness of the world that wants to bring us, separate us from our Father. And it's by praying. Prayer is so powerful that a Christian author, John Bunyan, he said this, Prayer will make a man stop from sinning, or sin will entice, will tempt a man to stop praying. You know, John Bunyan says it, hits it on the, uh, the hammer, the nail on the hammer right there. I messed it up, sorry. But <laughs> prayer, prayer is so powerful. And it does, it changes your life. It changes how we think and how we live our life for God. Of course, the word of God plays something, most importantly. But prayer is another factor as well. Well, this morning, I have an encouragement for all of us to be living a life that is committed to prayer. 
and how we can model our life after Daniel and to be a man and woman of prayer. Notice in verse 10, as we have read, there are five points that I believe that we can see from verse 10 that we can apply in our life towards prayer and we can become like a Daniel in the Bible. If you have notes and if you're writing down, if you're taking down notes, you can write down the first point that we have from Daniel in verse 10, and that is we need to have an upper room. Look at verse 10. It tells us that when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room. If you look at the Hebrew, the the, uh, phrase upper room literally means a room on the roof. And we need to remind ourselves of Middle Eastern culture during that time. We know that in the Middle East, it's not all nice like California weather, right? Except today, right? It's, It's raining. But the Middle East gets hot. And also the culture is noisy. They like to converse. They like to talk. Well, the upper room would provide the place to offer them cool breeze from the top air, uh, from the top of the roof. Or it would give them a room of quietness, a place to be just by themselves to not hear the noisiness from the streets. You know, it's interesting because if you look at the upper room, there were many great men in the Bible who had their own room on the roof particularly Elijah and Elisha, the two prophets. They had their own upper room when they wanted quiet time to seek the Lord. Also, we know that the apostle Peter in the book of Acts, he was on the roof praying when God did the famous vision with the sheets filled with animals come down before him and showed him what God was going to do with the Gentiles. When I think of the upper room, I literally think of the building that I used to own in Tokyo. Uh, I lived in the suburbs, but uh, away from the city. But life was just hectic even, even there. Tokyo is so crammed. It's so close-knit together. There's really no private space with your buildings. And uh, in the mornings, kids would be going to work, uh, to school. People would be going to work. Bikes would be going. Cars would be driving. And it gets pretty madhouse. Dra- the traffic gets busy. But then if you were to take walk up on my building three stories up, just only three stories, you don't hear anything. And then you would look and, oh, yeah, this is cool. And we were blessed with a little view of Mount Fuji. And I would just be looking, oh, yeah, God, you're awesome, right? And we would tell the Bible college students, too, that if you were to get up and do devotions on the rooftop, that's the best place because it would be quiet. You didn't have to hear your students, uh, your, t- your roommates snoring and everything. You could be by yourself. See, Daniel had a room on the roof, but for all of us, that doesn't mean we need to be praying up on our rooftops. Please don't do it. I don't want you to fall off and break your necks, please. See, what Daniel is showing us here is that we need to be often praying in an area that provides less distraction. We can look at Jesus, and he is our model about an upper room. See, Jesus, he would often leave his disciples and he would go pray by himself, spending time with him and the Father alone without his disciples to worry him. Jesus gives us his definition of an upper room best. In Matthew 6, 6, he says that when you pray, you are to pray by yourself, only between you and God alone, not worrying about other people around you. In fact, it tells us in Mark chapter 1, with the quiet time of praying, it tells us distinctly that Jesus would rise up in the morning before the sun would even rise and he would be praying. See, we need to be having an upper room in our our life. Well, what's an upper room? Zach, you said don't go up to the rooftops. You're right. But I ask you, is your living room quiet before the kids wake up early in the morning? That's an upper room. You know, our upper room could be any place that offers less distraction See, the, the world, when our day starts, boom, we just got to keep going. We got to get ready for our day. We got to get there on the freeway before traffic. We got to get going. Once our day starts, it's started. It's started. It's hard to just find quiet time if you're like me. But see, it's so good that we model our life like Jesus and Daniel. We find a place that offers less distraction, and we can just spend time with him and you alone. Before you, go to the, uh, before you go to work and your car's warming up for those five minutes, even ten minutes, that's a good place for an upper room. Maybe it is 5.15 before your kids wake up for school. That's a good time to be praying. That's your upper room, a time of quietness. We need to be praying in an upper room, less distraction. 
Well, if you notice, the second point, if you're writing it down, is we always need to be praying to the Father. Because notice it tells us in verse 10, the second point, that Daniel went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. I found that very interesting that his window was open in the direction where Jerusalem is located. See, we know that Daniel lived in Babylon, far away from Jerusalem, but his heart was still longing for that holy city. In fact, Adam Clark, a commentary, said that the Jewish people who did not live in Jerusalem, well, they would always pray in the direction where Jerusalem was located. And for the Jewish people who did live in the holy city, well, they would always pray in the direction where the temple was located. What's so special at what Daniel is doing? Well, again, he was praying towards Jerusalem. King David said it best in his Psalms that when you think of Jerusalem, you are literally thinking about God himself because God loves Jerusalem. God has made Jerusalem his holy city. And we know why Jerusalem is so important because that was where the temple was located. And that was where people would be able to offer up sacrifices. They would be able to build up their relationship more with God. They were connected with him at the temple. To think of Jerusalem was to think of God himself. See, I find it interesting that Daniel prayed in the direction of where the true God had his temple. His focus of direction wasn't on anything else but only on God. See, we don't read that Daniel was praying towards King Darius. Neither was he praying towards Babylon. Daniel wasn't even praying towards himself. But he was praying. His direction was fixed on God. In the Bible college, when we, uh, every Friday night, I would get together the students, and we would always usually spend a time of prayer, an hour and a half, where we pray as a community together. And uh, I could see... I can see how it's a struggle a lot of times for the students because they'll just be, we'll be praying and I kind of open my eyes to see, hey, how are things going? You see the students are listening and they're not in their head in agreement and then the countdown starts. They start sleeping, right? And I'll kind of hit them, hey man, wake up, right? Even for me, I'll be praying, Lord, I'm just thank you for today. And then all of a sudden these thoughts start coming in my head. Father, thank you for today. Take out the trash. Oh, yeah, I got to take out the trash. Then I go, no, 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 Lord, thank you for today. I got to do what you want me to do. Don't forget to discipline that student for not turning in his homework. Yeah, what's wrong with him? I told him that third time. No, 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 right? My direction, I got to fix it upon the Lord. See, Daniel was praying, and his mind was fixed upon the Lord, Jerusalem. And see, for us this morning is we need to pray to the Father, See, it is easy to get distracted in our prayer life. It is easy to start worrying about what we need to get done for the day or how we need to handle situations. But it's during our time of prayer, we need to focus on what we need to be doing. And that's praying to the Lord. Our mind is fixed on him like a crosshair. See, Psalms 16, 8, David says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be moved. There's no benefit when we start worrying about things when we're praying to the Lord. David said it best. God is our right, at our right hand. He will never be moved. He is our solid foundation, our rock. And our encouragement, again, is when we're praying, we need to be fixing our mind upon the Lord, our immovable rock, our solid foundation, and not to be moved by the worries of the world and what we need to get doing, be, need to be doing. Well, our third point in prayer is we need to be praying with humility. Please notice it tells us that after Dave, uh, Daniel opened the, his window towards Jerusalem, it tells us he knelt down on his knees. I think many can ask the question, or maybe you have asked that question, what is the best position to pray? We see pictures, we see the concept in our mind. Oh, well, best way to pray is with your eyes closed, right? If you're not keeping your eyes closed, you're not praying, we think. Or we can think the best position is with our hands folded together. That starts our way of prayer. Or maybe it is on our knees. Well, interesting enough that if you did do a study, a research of people who prayed on their knees, 
you see a lot of great men who were praying on their knees. You can read and see for yourself how Stephen the deacon was praying on his knees. Also the great Peter and also Paul and Luke. But I think for all of us, more importantly, the man who was praying on his knees, we can see is Jesus. It tells us Jesus was praying on his knees. I found that very interesting. See, any physical position is fine to pray. But again, it's so interesting when we think about praying on our knees because it's connected with so many great men in the Bible. Yet at the same time, God is not only interested that you pray on your knees. He is not interested in your physical condition, position, but he is interested in the condition of your heart. See, in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, Jesus gives a parable on how to properly pray by giving two men as his illustrations. We know this uh, parable because Jesus tells us the first man that he gives is the Pharisee, the religious ruler. And as the Pharisee was praying, he was just boasting before the Lord. Oh God, thank you for making me so great. Thank you for not making me like these people, Lord. I'm so holy. He proudly believed that he was better than other people during his prayer time. But then at the other same time, Jesus says there is the second man, and that is the tax collector. And as the tax collector is praying, he made no boasting of himself. In fact, Jesus tells us the tax collector continued to have his head down, not looking up. And he was beating his chest, just his anguish of heart, asking the Lord to continue to forgive him. See, God isn't interested in how we pray on our knees. It is good, but he's not interested. He's interested more in our heart. For Jesus tells us in Luke 18, verse 14, I tell you, this tax collector went down, uh, this tax collector went down to his house forgiven instead of the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, I love to ask for help, but then I hate asking for help at the same time. I love to ask help because I don't know what to do. So when I ask for help, I can figure out the problem that needs to get done. But at the same time, I hate it asking for help because it just shows I, I can't do it. It's kind of a humbling act. And, and, and that's how it is with me and my father. I'll call my dad. Hey, dad, I got to fix this flat tire. What I got to do? Okay, you got to go get a kit. And you got to go put it in. You got to puncture the tire again. You got to fix it out. And as soon as I start hearing and I understand the concept, then I go, I don't want to hear you no more. I, I, I know. And I, I, I don't tell him that. I don't tell him that. But then I just say, yeah, I know. Okay, okay. And then my dad will tell me, hey, man, you came to me. I didn't come to you. I'm like, Ugh, right? You get mad. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll believe you. But see, many times we can treat prayer like that. Don't you agree? We come before the Lord. God, I don't know what to do. Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, give me guidance. Give me counsel. And as soon as God starts answering your prayer, we're so quick to think, okay, I know what to do now, God. Thanks. No, 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 no. See, prayer involves humility. Every time we're coming before the Lord, it's an act of humility because you're always coming before the Lord in all situations, no matter what, when you come before him, we need to be humble. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The Bible also tells us that God resists the prideful, but he gives grace to the humble. We need to be praying in humility. Second, fourthly, we need to be praying with commitment. Notice that after he, Daniel prays on his knees, it tells us he prayed three times that day. Now, interesting, in the Hebrew, it literally means that Daniel prayed three times a day. Now, we can get the picture by reading just this verse in verse 10 that Daniel was worried. So he praying three times a day. He's very serious with the situation. Well, the opposite, Daniel is praying as his customary time three times a day. And we know that in Jewish culture, a dedicated Jewish person would pray to God three times that day, 9 a.m., 12, uh, 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. Daniel made it his priority not to skip his three customary times of prayer. His relationship had no compromise, but also Daniel's relationship had a deep 
commitment. I think for all of us, we have a deep commitment towards our three meals a day, don't you? I love to eat three meals a day. In fact, I got to control myself. I, I get too big. But you know, your body will remind you when you're skipping a meal or when you're too late. I'll barely go 15 minutes after 1230 when I usually eat lunch and my body starts reminding me. Oh, yeah, no, I'm hungry too, but just wait, man. Or my stomach starts growling. No, 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 we ate a big breakfast, man. Calm down. You got to eat. But I think for all of us, we don't skip our three meals a day. See, that's physical food that we're eating. Well, the same thing for us spiritually. We can't be skipping our three spiritual meals a day or not even three meals a day. We cannot be skipping our spiritual meals, the word of God and prayer. Me and my father have a mantra that we always tell the Bible college students that if you want God to change your life and if you want to be changed by him, then get up and do your morning devotions and get up and do your morning prayer. Don't skip it. We always tell them, you skip your morning devotions, you're going and you're walking, you're starting your day in the flesh. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we always tell them, we always encourage them that don't skip your morning devotions. And see, the same thing for Daniel. He didn't skip his customary times of prayer. He was praying with commitment. See, 1 Thessalonians tells us that we always need to be praying without ceasing. We need to always do it. Yet, in order to be praying without ceasing, we need commitment. Godly woman, Cory Ten Boom, says, Don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. I ask you, when was the last time you had a time you set aside during your day to spend time in prayer with the Lord? When was the last meeting you made with him to just converse with him and you alone? I encourage you to make an appointment with the Lord and to keep that commitment because you won't regret it. Well, notice fifthly, it tells us lastly, point five on prayer is that Daniel prayed with thanksgiving. It tells us that after he prayed three times a day, he prayed and gave thanks before his God. I find it so interesting how it tells us clearly two distinguishments. He prayed and gave thanks. In fact, if you did a word search and studying, prayed here means he was basically communicating with God. And next, he was giving thanks. He was praising the Lord. See, Daniel, what is significant here is he was praying to God, but he was also praising God within his prayer. See, we can think that praising God involves a guitar or it involves 30 minutes of worship, but that's not so true. By looking at Daniel, we can see that we can thank the Lord in our prayers as well. See, Daniel was thanking God even though he knew trouble was happening. See, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells us that there are four kinds of prayers. There is the prayer of supplication, that is humbly, humbly coming before the Lord to ask a need. Also, then there is the act of prayer, just basic talking. Then there is the prayer of intercession, praying for that loved one who's hurting or in need. Then there is the prayer of thanksgiving. See, Daniel was just praying, just conversing with the Lord. And he was thanking God as well. He, his heart wasn't heavy. He wasn't praying to the Lord. It doesn't tell us that he was supplicating or interceding. Again, he was just praying. He was just conversing to the Lord. His heart wasn't worried of the repercussions that would come his way for not praying to King Darius. See, and at the same time, he was giving thanks. He was coming before the Lord to thanking him. I have a little brother. His name is Asa. And as Christmas time comes and as his birthday time comes, he is so eager to always remind me that his special time is coming for gifts. In fact, I would call him and I would say hi because I don't live with him. And he would say, hey, how you doing? And as Christmas was coming up, he'd tell me, hey, remember, Christmas is coming. Oh, yeah, I know. So that means you got to get me gifts. Okay, yeah, I know I, I got to get you gifts. Okay, because remember, Christmas, you got to give gifts. Hey, man, okay, settle down. Okay, I get your drift. But then it happened so frequently that finally I just called him out and I said, Asa, I call on the phone to talk to you because I love you. You're my brother. But why do you always got to immediately go to the gifts? Well, it's Christmas and, you know, I, I just want to tell you what I want. Okay, I understand. 
But hey, man, don't you think I want to just talk to you more than just hear what you want and want and want? Sort of, yeah, he'll tell me. And then I just said, do you think I'm your bank? You think I'm just going to give you gifts? Well, sort of. I go, hey, man, hey, man, you better change. But after that conversation, it struck in his mind that, yeah, I can't be coming to my brother and always tell him what I want. See, I think for us, we, we switch our minds in, in treating God the same way with our prayers. And we connect our thanksgiving to him with strings attached. Lord, I thank you so much. Hey, you know my bills. I need that extra cash, Lord. You know, there's that string attached to the thanksgiving. See, Daniel was just conversing with the Lord and he was thanking him, thanking God, praising him for who he is. And the same thing for us is we need to be thanking the Lord with no strings attached. When was the last time that we just thanked the Lord for who he is, how good he has been towards us, how great and marvelous he is, the creator of the universe, and we have a relationship with him? I'm guilty. I'll tell you, I'm guilty. So many times I brought strings attached to my thanksgiving to the Lord. But we need to stop like Daniel. We just need to thank him for who he is. Psalms 96 verse 4. For the Lord is great and worthy to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Charles Spurgeon says it best. Prayer and thanksgiving in prayer go arm in arm. Again, we need to be thanking the Lord. We need to be giving thanksgiving to him. Now, as we come towards an end, we see our summary. And we can summarize what we have seen. And that is, nothing changed Daniel's lifestyle of prayer. He knew the outcome of his actions, but it didn't stop him. He continued in his daily five-point prayer life. And again, we are encouraged to be praying like Daniel. These five points. And the encouragement from the Lord is we need to be starting now in our prayer life. Is our life similar to Daniel? Are we praying like him? If not, or if so, great. Let us pray these five points in our life. If you notice at the very end of verse 10, it tells us that after he prayed all these things, it gives us a description, as was his custom since early days. See, Daniel was a man of prayer. He had an awesome prayer life, but it didn't just appear overnight. In fact, he had to continue in his five-point prayer life, and it gradually built up to the great man of prayer that we know him to be. Daniel's time of prayer started in his youth. See, I, I know for many of you, you're thinking, well, I'm not a youth. What are you saying, Zach? I can't go back in time. No, you can't. But what you can do is starting at the time of your youth right now, God is showing you. And starting in your life of prayer. We can't fool ourselves to think that overnight we're going to become a great man and women of prayer. Because it didn't happen to Daniel. And if it didn't happen to Daniel, then very likely it won't happen to us as well. We need to be training, building ourselves up to become great men and women of prayer. And again, it happens by, I believe, following these five points in verse 10. We need to have a room, a quiet room place that offers less distraction secondly we need to be praying to the father fixing our mind upon him thirdly we need to be praying in humility and not with pride fourthly we need to be praying with commitment making the effort and that set aparting that time in our days to pray to him and fifthly we need to be praying with thanksgiving no strings attached see i encourage you to be praying Maybe you're thinking, well, why do I need to be so strong in my commitment to pray? Well, because, again, it will strengthen your relationship with God. And your relationship with God will be your top priority, like Daniel. He had a no-compromise relationship. He had close intimacy. He had a close hearer, a clear hearing from the Lord. He had a deep personal devotional life. All because, again, his life was founded on prayer. A life that is committed to Jesus doesn't lack a life of prayer. See, for all of us this morning, we're encouraged to let prayer be our identity. Who are you? If you lost your money, if you lost everything that you own, and you had the clothes on your back, what is your identity? Well, I pray that it would be a man and woman of God.
who is built upon a life of prayer. Now, again, this is an encouragement for us. It's not condemnation, but it's an encouragement to leave these doors and to be reminded that we need to be praying. And now is the time to start with prayer. 